Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Two Wizards and a Mic, where two reasonably older people who have played D&D for a long time like to talk about it and hopefully provide you with information you may not have heard before. I'm hoping that's going to happen today. <laughs> I am Shane, and of course, to my right... I am Andrew. Or left. And uh, this podcast, of course, is brought to you by the fine purveyor, Kaywood Publishing, of all kinds of great books. Uh, worldofmere.com go check it out and buy everything because it'll totally be worth it hello so this week we're talking about backgrounds uh for characters last week we talked about rolling up your character kind of what dice you need to use all that kind of fun stuff and different options and this week uh one of the more important things at least for me is uh to get people into the mode of playing a character is to pick a background and uh, and try and just make it fun so uh but before we talk about that uh i understand that there is a one D update andrew inform us all all right we actually have two updates today uh one for one D, &D. uh just that in the second they've had basically two releases of some play test material they're working on for the next edition of D. &D. Uh, in the second one, we talked briefly about some of it, uh, some of the new ideas. So um, some of the other ones are that they're dividing the classes up into four sections, um, experts, uh, which are bards, rangers, and rogues, and then mages, which are wizards, uh, sorcerers, and warlocks, and warriors, fighters, rangers, and monks, and priests, clerics, druids, and paladins. And I have no idea why they would want to do that because it doesn't really do it just doesn't really mean anything um so they've got more changes for the bard the ranger and the rogue that they're looking at we talked a little bit about the ranger so they've made them a bit better um more powerful for sure because now when you use two weapons uh the second attack doesn't have to be a, a bonus action it can just be part of your attack oh, okay if you have two light weapons so that helps rangers quite a bit um and then they have hunter's mark permanently activated and um, they've got a few other things one that helps them regain hit points when they rest and um rogues they've taken away for now the sneak attack on a reaction uh, or a ready action uh, otherwise the rogue is pretty much the same for the most part the bard they've added some healing uh, which I think is unnecessary because there's so much healing already in the game. Um, yeah. yeah, they've made all of them a bit more powerful, again, which doesn't, you don't really need more powerful PCs in 5th edition, but it's nothing really major for the most part. They have some new rules they say they're going to have for for spells, for encounter building, and weapons, but they, and for making a headquarters for your party, but they haven't given any details. Mm -hmm. Um, they're adding a lot more fleet feats and influence action and the ex exhaustion they've changed for the better. They've made it very clear and simple how you run exhaustion now, which I think is really good. Oh. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Cause that's always kind of been one of those things that's sort of up in the air and kind of up to the, the game master to kind of interpret how it's written in the, in the player's manual. So, and the DMs. Got uh, it, so. It's a little clunky. At least that's my impression anyway. Yeah, I think it's a bit clunky. I don't think a lot of people use it. That's my impression. The, the new version is much simpler, and I, I definitely would use that new version. I don't know if I would use much from 5.5 that's coming, but I would use that for sure. Um, the other update is quickly for our Kickstarter for Monsters of Feyland 2. So the art, all the art is done except the color ver versions of all the art. So that's going to take a while. That'll probably take nice. um, most of, maybe most of November. We'll see uh, how that goes. And then all the old PDFs, the PDFs that we'd already published, those have all been sent out now, including the people who pre-ordered books after the Kickstarter. So if people don't have those, they need to email us and we'll get them to them. And it, they come to you in your Kickstarter inbox in the messages section of Kickstarter. We don't email them to your email address. And yeah, that's the update for the most part. The other thing is that we continue to work on the manuscript for book six. Nice. 
All right, so that's updates. Um, I, I'm still back on the experts, mages, priests, warriors categorization, which makes no sense to me whatsoever. I'm like, what? Yeah. Are, how is a bard an expert of of what? Are they like this is their career or something? But clerics yeah. and paladins, they kind of have a career too. So how are they? Well, they've linked yeah, it with something, an expertise feature. They've linked them a little bit, but there's no there's no reason to group them like this. I mean, uh, yeah, anyway. So, backgrounds. Makes no sense. Fun stuff for today. Um, basically, <laughs> where your character came from, how you became an adventurer, uh, your place in the world. These are the kind of things they talk about in the player's handbook. And it could be the, a job that you had when you were a young, a teenager or a young adult. So there's a number of backgrounds listed in the player's handbook. So we're going to go through those today, and then we'll quickly mention some new ones they've um, proposed with 1D&D. &D. And um, then we'll go through a little bit more of making your character before we end it tonight and uh, role-playing. So the basic backgrounds in the player's handbook, the first one is an acolyte. So this is basically someone who is in the service of a temple. So they would... Uh, be working at a temple um, either in service of a specific deity or following. Um, they have a feature where you can get shelter with the temple, you and your party, um, which is useful. Um, except I think some of the ideas here for features, like these backgrounds, a lot of them that have these extra features you can get. Um, a bunch of them are very specific, and then they say you can use this anywhere. Well, that doesn't really make sense. Like, for example, this shelter of the, of the faithful. Say you were in a different city, and um, they didn't worship that deity, or the worshiping was different. Then yeah. you it wouldn't make sense for you to get this shelter feature where you'd be looked after. So I think... I think these features would, if I was DMing and people use the back, these backgrounds, I would say they apply at certain times in certain places, not just across the board. So charlatan. So this is, this is interesting because this is sort of like this modern anti-hero gray area we get into where right. charlatan takes advantage of people. And they are very good at reading people and understanding people's natures, and they use it to their advantage. So if someone's a hero, an adventurer, and this was their background, you would have to, unless you have an evil character, you would have to really make an interesting story of how they've changed. Because why would a person like this become an adventurer? Yeah. Um, you have an, a, a <laughs> special feature where you can create a false identity. That's cool. So um, that's part of that background. Another one which is, you know, sort of problematic making a hero is the criminal background where you can be a number of criminals. They give you a number of options, uh, burglar, blackmailer, enforcer, fence, highway robber, hired killer, pickpocket, smuggler. Some of those, again, like, Oh, I was a hired killer, but now I'm going to go on an adventure with a group of people and work together for the betterment of the kingdom. <laughs> that is so, so yeah. it just it's like that character I played where the character had this addiction to cutting off the ears of whatever the heck it was. Happens. And that was hard to play. And and you were like, yeah. uh, how do I do this if he cuts off an ear in front of other players? Which eventually happened. Which then made it interesting because it's like, it's kind of like the character tries to, and and then we came up with ways to reform them and stuff. Because, but the yeah, the criminal one is just totally, it's a weird one to play with. Yeah, I think if you're creative, I think the smuggler part of it is easy to do. We've done that. This a smuggler doesn't have to be evil. Um, yeah. Uh, the feature you get with the criminal background is that you get. Um, a criminal contact feature where you have contacts in a criminal organization. So again, there's creative ways that you could do that so it could work. Um, I should yeah. mention that these backgrounds in the original version of the player's handbook, the current one, they come with a few extras, not just these features. They also come with skill proficiencies. They come with languages. 
and they come with a little bit of equipment, which I think makes sense. Um, so we've done, uh, yeah, so then the entertainer. So again, you have lots of choices for entertainer. You could be an actor. You have you had a character that was a dancer. Um, you could be a fire eater, they say, a juggler, um, a poet, storyteller. And the there's a variant, a slight version of an alternate version of the entertainer where you could be a gladiator as your background. And um, their feature is called by popular demand. So this is where you can do a performance and um, through the performance, you can get room and board basically at an inn or a tavern or somewhere. Um, and again, I would say that some, usually that would work, but not necessarily. Um, maybe the DM decides the crowd, you know, actually hates this performance and there's nothing that you could do to impress them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, I've always wanted to play a character that was a storyteller, but one of those characters that like narrates their life right, <laughs> while right. writing it all down. And they, <laughs> that you, would just get so annoying. But it's a challenge. Time. Yeah, speak in third person all the time. <laughs> Jimmy's going into the try dungeon. that sometime. Jimmy can't wait to get into the dungeon. <laughs> Jimmy is now in the dungeon. Jimmy's the dungeon has not changed for seven days. Yeah. Jimmy's going to check for traps. Um, oh, man, I, I, I like that idea already. Uh, another background is the folk hero. So this is where you are a basically a peasant. You have very humble beginnings, and you do something incredibly heroic. And even before you're an adventurer and the game starts, you already have, you have this um, reputation and this history behind you. This is a great idea. And the feature you has is, have is rustic hospitality. So this is basically that the people um you're one of the people and people actually help you out and look after you a bit and again they make it kind of a blanket statement but i don't think that would carry over for maybe the whole campaign because there'd be some areas where they wouldn't know who you were or maybe yeah. maybe they're you're not a hero to them right so um i think these some of these features are they should have some kind of boundaries on them for them to make sense uh, then we have guild artisan. So basically, you're part of a a guild of some sort of special skill, like um, a blacksmith guild, a brewer, um, or cartographer, cook. There's lots of choices, and your feature is that you have membership in this guild, so that comes with privileges. So I think this is a great one. Fits totally into the lore. That, I've actually never played that one before. That actually would be quite like if you're a blacksmith especially and stuff like that like if you oh you're just you know let's make your swords more powerful there's something that could be done or yeah repairing of armor that's been damaged or that's actually really a cool one i'd, I'd never thought yeah that. i think it's that's really kind of... good it's really good to fit into the story with different factions and you can really immerse that kind of character into the into the city or the village wherever you're living you know um, then you could also have like conflicts with other kinds of factions. You know, maybe you're there actually is a variant where you can be a a merchant, a part of a merchant guild, and then there could be rivalries between different trading guilds. That that would be really fun. Um, that is actually very cool. Yeah, and then one that quite a few people choose is the hermit. Um, so pretty self-explanatory. You live apart from society. And the feature is kind of cool because it's a discovery feature where you've discovered something in your in your soli in your solitary um, life Pursuits. in your seclusion. <laughs> you've discovered some incredible secret, something that nobody else knows, something and something important. Right. So I, I like that quite a bit. Then we have the noble, a variant of which is the knight. You could be a knight or a regular noble. Um, your feature is a position of privilege, so you have a lot of um, you have a lot of um, bonuses basically because of your noble title and your status. I've used noble a few times myself, but just because I thought it would be kind of cool to have like the. I think it was actually with one of the tieflings I played uh, in the last year or so, like the, the ability where this character has actually done a lot of good within their sort of town and whatnot. And, and they're sort of, you know, 
wanting to give back to everyone because they know they're a lucky sort of individual, you know, mm-hmm. with a rich family and stuff. Yeah. And then something terrible happens and then they're forced to, to go out on their own for whatever reason. Right. And uh, that kind of idea is really kind of nice to play with. Um, the knight idea, that I actually hadn't really thought of as a variant as, as how that could be uh, similar to like a paladin because the paladins always, you know, they've got this quest for defeating mm-hmm. evil generally. and mm-hmm. But a knight could be on a quest for a different reason, which is actually kind of nice. Yeah, and not every paladin comes from wealth, but every um, but in the knight background, every knight in this way would come from wealth. Yeah, um, yeah. A lot of people choose this one. Generally, people either go the route of "I am a noble, I'm better than everyone else," or "I am a noble, but like you said, they understand that they are in a position that they can actually help people." Yeah. So That's yeah. Actually very cool. Yeah, there's lots of options there. Uh, another one is the sage. So you have different versions of this. You could be an alchemist, a librarian, an apprentice, a few versions, a scribe. And the feature is researcher. So you basically have the skills to find out how to research about something. So you might not know about it, but you know, oh, we can go to the Grand Library in the capital city. And I know that the, there should be a book about that subject. So that has endless I, possibilities. I don't know. Did I choose? I can't remember. Actually, I think the background I chose for my my archaeologist is actually from uh, Xanathar, if I remember oh, okay. correctly. Uh, Sage actually sounds very familiar, but I like the researcher feature, which the other one doesn't have. That's actually yeah. cool. Yeah. So, and a sage is really appropriate for a wizard um, because um, you're studying and researching. And usually the sage, the sage is going to be an apprentice to a master. So it's perfect for a wizard. Then we have sailor, um, which is quite popular because you could come up with a really interesting story. You could have a character who's not necessarily from the area where the adventure starts. You could have somebody from very far away. Um, so they could have a certain position on the ship. They could be high ranking a sailor or they could be just a cabin boy or, uh, you know, somebody who just swabs the deck, literally. Um, your ship could be interesting. There could be lots of stories about what's happened to the ship and where you've traveled. And this is all before you start your character. Uh, there's a variant. You can to have be a all pirate. kinds of stories. That's really amazing, actually. Yeah, there's a variant to be a pirate. And the feature is a ship's passage feature, which again is very useful. And um, one of the players in one of our groups used that recently um, when we were doing our Greyhawk campaign. Um, she, oh, cool. because of her contacts, she helped secure a ship's passage from for you from one town to another um, when you went to the Wild Coast. So that's pretty... Yeah, so you can basically get, you can help, the, a number of these features are to help out the whole party, not just the character. Then we have soldier, very traditional. Um, you could be an officer, you could be low ranking, you could be a scout, cavalry, um, lots of options. There's a, a feature where your military rank still counts for something. So if you if you deal with the military again, they have to respect the rank. And then the very last one in the player's handbook is the urchin. So this is pretty, this is an older name. So some people might not even know this, but it's basically that you grow up, you grew up on the streets for some reason as a, as a kid, a teenager. And your, your feature is that you know secrets about the city that can help you get around. And, um, sorry about that. So the, um, The one thing about this, again, is I don't think it transfers. So it says that any city you go to, you can invoke this city secret feature to find out information about the city or to run faster through the city. Like, I like that idea of, um, like, you could run down alleyways and maybe jump um, fences or climb up walls or run across the rooftops. And you know these are all these little routes. But I think that should only count for the area that this character knows. Not if you go to every city and all yeah. of a sudden, you know, that doesn't make sense that all of a sudden, you know, all the ways to go. 
you show up and like people just welcome you and like oh yes yeah. of course other urchins look how we're going to be together and you show me your secrets no that yeah it doesn't yeah. really make any sense that or kind of like, needs oh, to be like a learned to... thing exactly yeah you know oh we have to go down that alley oh no turn left like you've never been there before you know like now we've got to climb up this wall and get up to the rooftop and i know there's a place through there well how, you've never been here so. And you, you walk through the gates of the city and suddenly, oh, I feel a map has just appeared in my bag. Oh, look, yeah. I know everywhere. <clears throat> yeah, that's that doesn't really work. So an interesting change that connects with 1D&D &D and um, uh, their proposals for backgrounds is they want to link uh, modifiers for your abilities to your background instead of race. And I don't think that that makes sense. So, for example, what they're doing is um, in... Your say you want to be, um, hold on one second. Say you want to be a farmer, then your strength would be higher because you worked on the land a lot. I think yeah. that there some of that makes sense, but it's better to link it with your race because some of it doesn't make as much sense. Like basically the sage, like we just talked about. Their idea would, the new idea would be that you're in your studies, you got smarter. Where I think it makes more sense that you're, you became a sage because you were brighter and you, do you know what I mean? And you became a farmer yeah. because you could work on the land and you were used to that and your family did that. And, and you're, you know, it's almost again like they're ignoring science and biology. Like, you know, yeah, because it would make sense if you had some ability modifiers that you get from whatever race you've chosen and some based on what you decide your character, has, like what their background is going to be, because are they doing it? Are they deciding one or the other? Is that sort of how they're? they're yeah, they're proposing that they get rid of it from the races. No more ability modifiers. So even though dwarves are hardy and tough, they're taking they want to take their con modifier away and give that to a, a background like the farmer or uh, maybe the guard or the urchin, give them the con. That, I think I can understand why dumb. you might. Yeah. <laughs> I think it works better the original way. Um, and it makes it really complicated if you try to blend it. Um, yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, so there, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, I think there should be, kind of like it is right now like tweak how it is tweak how the backgrounds provide abilities or modification or whatever uh you know feats or or, or features or like yeah having it entirely based upon that rather than the genetics of the character like that to me yeah this this is a this is weird i yeah I mean, yeah it's kind of silly but yeah, uh I like you know, if I don't. Were... I don't think this will stick around. I think this one's gonna gonna fall on its face. I think a little bit. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> it doesn't really make sense if you follow it logically because, say, you're an, you ch you chose to be a guild artisan, um, and you are an apprentice when you do that. And when you start out as an apprentice, you have to do all the menial labor. You have to clean, and you have to say you're a mason or something. You know, you're. You're doing all the hard labor. Um, if you're a cook, go and cut you know, me bricks out of that limestone over there with a yeah. with this small tool. Go to it. Right. Yeah. So say <laughs> say you're a guild artisan and <clears throat> and you're in your apprentice. So why don't you get a if you follow this logic? Why don't you get a bonus for strength because you're going to build up your strength and your constitution a little bit with doing all this hard work? But no, they're putting um, the modifier onto charisma, I believe because you can become more charismatic uh, as a guild artisan, which again, it, yeah, it, I, I think it just what? Make, yeah, it just, it's logically, it doesn't make sense. Uh, that, blah. Yeah. So we'll see. Like, It'll yeah, be interesting, this, yeah. interesting to see what people think. So the new backgrounds, um, they've proposed some new ones, uh, cultist, which again, I think is problematic, but if there's a creative way you could, you could do it, like getting out of the cult, right? Um, yeah. That would be funny for a character to be, you know, it used to be in a cult and then the party keeps running into their old cult all the time. 
Barry, hi! I didn't know you were back. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, stab, stab, stab. Yeah, and then they could tell like other party members. You won't believe what Larry did last. You know, a couple months ago. You know, <laughs> he flayed those children alive. It's terrible. Wow, our cult's yeah. so funny. That took a dark turn. I would say uh, <laughs> <laughs> that he, uh, yeah, you know, maybe cults, he, he, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He summoned, uh, you know, he summoned a devil a few months ago, and. Um, so there's cultists, there's farmer, which I think is awesome. Um, there's so many iconic stories with farmer as the farmer boy becomes the hero or farmer girl. Um, yeah. and it fits into the lore of the medieval world. Um, yeah. So, uh, gladiator straight up, not as a variant. They have that <coughs> guard, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> we have a lot of smoke in the city right now. And I think it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really pretty in the mornings, but by this time of the day, it's I can yeah. feel it right now. Like it's yeah, yeah it's not pleasant. Um, yeah, we're in this. Uh, it's like we're in this pod here with all these filters running, cleaning the air inside here right now. Um, so a guard is another one, which I think is a really good one that fits into um, D and D really well. Laborer, perfect, and pilgrim. So a lot of these I think fit really well, and. Um, there's lots of others. I think I, you know, I I think athlete should be one. I think that would be a great one. Yeah. Why um, not? Then there they talk about oh, there's a choice where you can make a custom background. Well, you could always do that. <clears throat> Just like the rest of D and D, yeah. if you want to do something, you know, talk to your dungeon master, and the game is open for you to create. So. All right. What? Um, it's other... a game. This is just a yeah. game. What? Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Um, other parts of your backstory, so other than your background, which can be linked all together, uh, is deciding where's your hometown. I know I always ask the players in my groups to figure out where you're yeah, from. Yeah. Um, is it far away? Is it a village, a town, a city? Did you grow up in the wilderness? Um, and then family. I think family is really interesting. We talked last week you, about how you'd mentioned with one of your tiefling characters a bit about her parents. So then I decided to throw yeah, them yeah. in to the story. And we had these great encounters where, like you said, you sort of went back to the the younger version of that tiefling where the parents became the authority again. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you mean like real life? <laughs> yeah. So, um, well, there's a great quote from this spiritual teacher, Ram Das. He says, uh, if you think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your parents. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean... <laughs> This is the thing with 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 the backgrounds, which I've really in the last couple of sessions, not sessions, but the last sort of campaigns, I've really tried to sort of delve into it a hell of a lot more d in detail right. because, A, it's fun to do. But um, just reading this uh, thing about family, about small, big, closed, dysfunctional, etc. Uh, my next character is going to be like the middle child of like 13, you know, <laughs> and, right. and, and see what we could make of that into, the, into a story. Like that yeah. would be very cool. Like that kind of, it gives you so many options. Oh yeah. I'd be like, there's a dozen new characters. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. Like, and they're all and right out their stat blocks too. Um, they're all, in but a cult. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of awesome. <laughs> a family cult. Okay. Yeah. So yes, you mentioned I wrote on the notes there. So your family could be small. Maybe you only have one parent. Um, maybe it's very large, like you were talking about. Maybe they're very close and they can actually help your character and support them. I've I've done that in in, in adventures. Maybe they're totally dysfunctional. Yeah. I've done that a lot. <laughs> um, actually, we just had in our last game on Sunday night, a uh, player player's father was killed by the party because. He turned out to be an evil fae, arc fae. Oh, man. Yeah, you missed Spoilers. it. Spoilers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, and your family could have lots of different issues. So there's lots to mine there for your character. And uh, as well, friends, obviously. Are they loyal friends? Um, do they have the same goals as you? Uh, are they skilled? Are they also adventurers? Can they give support? So that's... We've, we usually run into that in most of our stories. Friends usually come, a lot of people, I would say, excuse me, I'd say probably a third of the backgrounds that I read have some, have a mention of a friend at least, which again, adds, gives me new characters. So I like that. And That's one awesome. of them, one of the players in our group, they made it that their best friend when they were young 
was now their arch enemy. And Ooh. they had turned to the good side and their best friend had turned to the dark side. That's cool. So that was... That gives I, you so much to play with. Yeah, exactly. Um, then you can think about if your player character is involved with a faction. Are you part of the Thieves Guild, Fighters Guild, Wizards Guild, a Merchants Guild, like we mentioned before? So that can add some more flavor to your character. Um, alignment, of course, we talked about it last week quite a bit. That's pretty central to the morality of your character. And as I mentioned last week, in my opinion, it's not something that's being imposed into the game. It's something that's already there. And the alignment just explains the morality of your player. Uh, these days, that's not popular, but yeah. it's there. You can't do anything about it. Um, role playing. So in general, you know, you have so many choices. I mean, Sometimes I look at an image for a character or an NPC and I get all the ideas from the image. So, you know, for example... That's actually really important because searching for a portrait, which I think we mentioned last time or maybe a little while ago, yeah, um, that can really inspire you visually about, about, you know, being able to like, you know, take a search on Pinterest or on, on Google, just in general, and, and look for yeah. portraits of, of D and D characters. Um, you know, if you're a, a tiefling or if you're a human or if you're this or you're that, and you can search for those, uh, based on, you know, whether or not you're a barbarian or what kind of class you are. And just looking at those images will give you a really interesting sort of, I mean, for all of these things, not just the role-playing part of the alignment or, or thinking of what your ideals and things are. Um, you can kind of get a flavor, like you just instinctually kind of look at a thing. And you're like, "Oh, that looks cool. That's a character I really want." That's kind of what my what my mind's eye is sort of thinking of, and that can inform. You can actually go back and be like, "Actually, no, the background I chose. Uh, blah, 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 no, I'm going to make it of this." And mm -hmm. Ooh, maybe I shouldn't be that class. I should be that class, you know. And just can it, can it can give you a lot of fun to it. It adds all that level of you know creativity that some people I still find struggle to get to that point. So. Uh, it's just a good tool to have. Yeah. Yeah. I think people, you know, people can play however they want. I know there's some people who say, you know, here's some hints how to be a player or a better player. I don't believe that at all. It's just a game. I don't think the players, I think the players should just be respectful and show up and the rest of it's just for fun. And if you want to role play so much, you have an accent and you're a hundred percent in character as an improv actor. That's great. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. Um, I think people should just play the way they want. So um, we were talking, I, I was just mentioning what you were going to say, you know, the image I, that comes to mind right away is when I found on Pinterest of this very graceful kind of half elf uh, male who to me looked like a bard. And I could just right away, I just got this whole story of him. He's actually in this book in Monsters of the City. Um, he died in session one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, but he lives forever in Monsters of the City. Um, so I came up with this whole detailed story and everything was really followed from how graceful he was and he had style and he had a catchphrase. And um, I, I named him after this tour of David Bowie, kind of inspired by Bowie too. And I called him Serious Moonlight, which is a tour that David Bowie did in the 80s. And his catchphrase was, let's get serious. <laughs> and um he was kind of this swashbuckling stylish uh, bard and i had all these high hopes for him and then in session one like i am you know the one thing with pretty much every character i play is that they will always help out the party no matter what um and they will go for the big bad evil guy right away and try to take them down and so Sirius did that, but his minions got me. <laughs> so I took out the leader, the lead cult guy, um, but the rest of them got me. Yeah. That's first so level, <laughs> first session. But now he's I've got this whole plan. It's gonna be great. Yeah, it's gonna be amazing. I have to think of something else now. <laughs> yeah. 
so, oh, um, so yeah, there's so many choices. You can think of a character that you really like you've seen in a story, in a movie, TV show, or a book or something. Um, you can think about somebody who, like we have a, another player in our group is basically playing Han Solo, uh, her version of Han Solo. Um, there's one player that we always have in our group whose characters, no matter what she does, her characters always think they're better than everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Which is hilarious to watch. I think you might know what player I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. So every character she has always ends up arguing with the party, <laughs> arguing with the NPCs, arguing with people that you meet. <laughs> and it's totally awesome, and I love yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so you'll you'll notice that, too. I think it's very rare that people make characters that don't have something that connects to who they are as a person. Um, yeah. Sometimes if you're really intentional and you really know yourself well, you might make somebody a character who's totally different. But um, you probably will still play that with traits from yourself, I would guess, as the, as the story goes on, because I think it's hard not to do that. But yeah, it's, fun to, it's fun to try to make somebody really different. Um, I usually like characters who are kind of near the action, um, you know, near the front, usually leading the party or close to the front. But one time I made a wizard who I gave him lots of powerful attack magic, like evocation magic. But he was right. very casual where he would kind of, he would stay at the back and then he would like come to the forefront, like throw a fireball, a lightning bolt, and then uh, walk away whistling and hide around the corner. So the idea was that he caused maximum chaos and destruction, but he he wasn't at the front of the action right away. He kind of held back and and um, and he acted without thinking. So he'd open a door. I remember one time he opened a door in a, in a temple, and the dungeon master said, "You see, like twelve skeletons um, animated, you know, with weapons." And I just said, I, I cast a fireball and then close the do door and run back, <laughs> whistling. <laughs> no, I didn't say run. I said I walk back slowly whistling. <laughs> I'll just set fire to this and I might cast that spell over here and see if that yeah. comes to life. And then I'm going to go over there and then I'm going to go over Klein and see what happens. Yeah. Although I think acting very quickly is pretty common with most of my characters. I had a paladin in the Giants adventure and we found out, I'm pretty sure I was playing with you, with your halfling manager. He was managing a fighter, oh, yeah, yeah. gladiator. And we found out this woman in this house was, we pretty sure she was evil. And I think her husband, we'd found her husband, his, her husband killed. So I just quickly like scaled the house or broke into the second floor and then immediately killed her. And everyone in the party is like, you're a paladin. What are you doing? You can't just. <laughs> but evil. <laughs> but we knew, like, we were pretty sure that she was very evil and she just murdered her husband. So, you know, that's how. I that's think it was I obvious. Think. Like, it was quite obvious, I think, at that. I seem to recall that, yeah. Yeah, but that's I awesome. do remember <laughs> one or two players were like, you're a paladin. What are you doing? Well, paladins can act with, you know, swift confidence. <laughs> oh, exactly. That's so what they're trained other, for. Yeah. So some other things they've added into the background, backstory, they call them characteristics that you can decide for your character. And they're listed in the actual section with the um, backgrounds. I think these are ideals, which are basically the principles of your character. Yeah bonds which are things that your character is really strongly connected to and flaws which are obviously the flaws of the character and these are a lot of fun um you can make your own if your dm likes um, but there's a lot of great choices i'll just look really quickly here for example at um well let's choose folk folk hero so they okay. also add in a per personality trait table and um, one of them for this um, background is thinking is for some people, I prefer action. So that's, that's a good trait you could add to your character. And then ideals, um, let's say you're a good uh, lawful good character. 
So your ideal would be respect. Um, people deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. So that's your ideal, the principles of your character. Your bond, mm -hmm. which which is what you're you're close to, is um, I protect those who cannot protect themselves. So that's kind of something that stays with you all the time. And um, then your flaw, um, this is a great one. I have trouble trusting in my allies. <laughs> I love having flaws that can get in the way because mm -hmm. you can choose to use them or choose to ignore them. But they can, if you do use them, they can cause all kinds of chaos. Like your ideal could get in the way, your bond could get in the way. But flaws are just kind of that slightly easier one where it's like, you know, uh, can't like can't hold your liquor. Like as yeah. an example you have in our in our show notes, that is brilliant because, you know, you every every day you, your characters have to rest at some point. And if there is a pub nearby or a, or a tavern, that could cause all kinds of chaos. Like yeah. I know that some of our characters that if they've had too much or they have like four or five, you're like, OK, well, we're going to roll this table here that yeah. oh, you wake up and you're in a dress, you know, or something yeah. along those lines where you yeah. have to suddenly react to that. And uh, yeah, it can cause all kinds of great stuff to happen or terrible yeah, I agree. stuff, but it's still great. Yeah, that's very popular in our groups is the uh, you're having problems with alcohol. And um, usually I if you if the character keeps drinking, I'll say, give me a con check. And if the yeah. constitution check fails then i've got tables from our books that we publish um there's some in the between dungeons handbook that we have um which you can get on our website that we have a carousing table on there and yeah the, you could wake up the next morning in a different part of the city you could wake up married uh you could wake up with a tattoo so which um, my character did my character woke up married once and yes. i think was that i think that was to a witch though or or a, or a, a oh. sea hag or something I forgot. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that you had a romantic engagement with a hag. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then, uh, you know, then got they it. said we were getting married or something and it was, it was, it, it caused all kinds of grief. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another good one is that your character can't keep a secret. So that, that's, yeah. a, that's pretty interesting. The rest of the party is like, keep quiet. Like, don't, you don't tell them that it's like uh Hagrid in, um, Harry Potter, when he says, he tells the kids something he shouldn't have said. And he goes, in the movies, they have this line where he goes, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's all kinds of character traits you could have. These are, there's actually a bunch of them listed in the Dungeon Master's Handbook. Um, things like, your, well, I don't think they have this one, but I would. The close talker, um, mumbling, uh, your character maybe has a limp. Maybe they're introverted or extroverted. Maybe they're really confident or not, you know, not not confident. Maybe they're clumsy. That's a good one to have, actually. I like that one. Um, yeah, yeah. There's many many different um, ways of making them. We'll we'll put the link again for our Pinterest collection because it has thousands. I think it's. I think I counted. I think we've got like fourteen thousand images on that collection. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, people can look. I have no there. idea. Yeah, it's like a thousand pictures of warriors, like 500 pictures of wizards, things like that. Nice. So there's a lot of great um, ideas. Um, and in the Dungeon Master's Handbook, in the Player's Handbook, there's lots of ideas as well. And uh, yeah, the possibilities are endless. Another Another option is to look in a collection of NPCs and take NPCs that are ready made as characters. So we have a bunch of books on our site and on the DMs Guild. In the DMs Guild, we actually have a whole series called Friends and Foes. And there are three books from levels 1 to 20. And we have every single class. And uh, any of those NPCs could be made into a player character. And it, it, everything's so there. Even a, We even put equipment and some of your backstory and everything's there. So yeah, the, the choices are endless. That is so cool. I love, I want to be a close talker now. 
We could also mention too about role playing. I mean, I think you know the first rule of improv, right? Oh, yes. The yes rule. Oh yes. <laughs> so that always that say always, yes. Yeah, that always helps. Uh, I think in D and D, um, sometimes you don't want to say yes a hundred percent of the time, but um, I think for the players and the dungeon master especially, I think most of the time that helps the game keep flowing, and um, you know, players can try things. It doesn't mean they're going to work. So I think it helps to keep the game flowing. Is there's an idea in improv that you just keep going with the flow of what's happening, and you yeah. take what you take what the other people, the other actors are giving you, right? Yeah, exactly. Because you have to, if you're going to do anything on stage or in a role playing game, uh, if you say no. Uh, enough times then nothing happens because you're just blocking everything that anyone else is suggesting and uh so yeah the rule of of role playing i mean i think that improv informs how role playing should happen in games because in in you know every way mm -hmm. because you know you if you commit to something like a character uh trait or a flaw or a particular skill uh just keep running with it even mm -hmm. even if it changes because it can change you're allowed to change like if you decide for some reason you know something happens in the adventure and your character has an encounter or some sort of experience that says you know i just don't want to be a warrior anymore i want to i'm going to be a farmer from now on i'm just going to lay down my sword and that kind of stuff is great because mm -hmm. a it challenges the character to evolve it challenges the player to evolve with it uh, if they're, you know, confident enough or brave enough to do it. But even more so, the DM going, I just had a night in, in the game, and now I don't because this thing happened, and that's actually quite cool. So how do I move this party forward with like, that significant character change? Because, I mean, maybe it'll make a huge impact, maybe it won't, but the 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 fact that, you know, being able to just kind of flow with how stories can inform the characters because the characters should never start and end the same way if they've not you know they maybe people like playing where they're just suddenly their character has ten thousand gold and that's their reward but it's more interesting when you actually have a character actually move forward and say hey you know i kind of want my character to learn something even if it's just at the back of your mind like at some point paying attention to what's going on on the board and how that actually informs the role-playing aspect. I mean, the some of the greatest game sessions I've ever been in have been you have an encounter and then suddenly you have to solve something or you know, look at a puzzle closer and then you end up role-playing with characters trying to figure something out and then two hours have gone by it doesn't feel like two hours have gone by and the DM's like, dudes, I, nothing needs to happen because you guys are just doing great. Uh, you know, Oh, it's now raining and that's all that changes, you know, that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, allowing that to happen and allowing you to, to, to change your character because, you know, it's pretty rare for extreme changes as I'm kind of laying it out, but you know, even subtle ones can be really important. So, um, don't get stuck that your character is this character and that's all it's ever going to be because that just ultimately becomes boring. At least I find it becomes boring. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's an option for people. We had, um, we had one player in our first campaign when we started with fifth edition, who was a bard, a kind of happy go lucky halfling bard. And he married his sweetheart, but then he decided that she was going to come into on the adventures with him. And the first adventure she came on was going into a dragon's lair to slay a dragon. And she didn't make it. And so he decided his character was going to change into this dark, brooding, vengeful, um, sort of Batman-like character. And um, he then started multi-classing in Rogue. And it was it was an interesting change, and it worked like really well in the story. And yeah, I think that that what you're talking about is definitely an option of how to play your character to have an arc. Um, 
So anytime yeah. parents come into the game and they die, that character just becomes Batman. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And suddenly they yeah. adopt a character trait of talking like, I'm Batman. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we talked about before about having backup characters if your character dies and having a connection between your character who died and your new character. And yeah. I, I like that idea of uh, a kid coming back to avenge their parent or 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 the opposite. Um, or a family member or a twin, you know, like, you know, maybe you're your twin brother now oh, a twin. okay that would be cool yeah <laughs> i'm just i'm barry that was larry and i'm also a insert yeah. character <laughs> class here that's oh, right yeah we've been doing stuff together for a long time but we decided to you know take a break yeah <laughs> i see you've been to the dungeon master school of naming <laughs> tonight with <laughs> barry and, barry and larry <laughs> All right, I got that one done. Our next character. Yeah, there's so many. Um, there's so many great memes about that because I think it's so useful. The last thing I usually do before I start DMing is I write a list of about ten or twelve names. Um, there's also a whole uh, ton of names in the Xanathar book. Yeah, and I've actually used that as inspiration a couple times. Yeah, it's really good. So it's good to have those extra names because. Once in a while, you'll be in a little village. Maybe you didn't plan on going there. That the dungeon master didn't plan on this side trip, and uh, the characters will meet the the village guard, and he and they'll be like, "Oh, hi, what's your name?" And most dungeon masters are like, uh, um, "Barry, uh, Larry, uh, Kronk." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's always i mean good to have a, li a list of names um yeah and it, and that list in xanathar's is great to use for naming your character for ideas unless you want to be barry or larry then we just gave you those <laughs> yeah, those are free you could those are we'll write those down in the, in the description because and Kronk, you know you want to use Kronk and, and Kronk. yeah Kronk the barbarian <laughs> yeah that is my next character. Kronk That's you know Barbarian. what you should do. You should play you know Kronk from Emperor's New Groove. Yep. Uh, I can't remember the actor. He's the same actor who plays uh, Putty on Seinfeld, he, and he plays the tick. Oh, yeah. Uh, I I can hear his is voice in my head, but yeah, I, I know exactly. David, what you're talking about. maybe is it David? Or, oh no, it was David Putty. I think it was Putty's name. But anyway, that um, that Kronk character would be a really funny D and D character who is dumb as a you know the most unintelligent you know sort of like a barbarian but it could it wouldn't have to be a barbarian that yeah. would be funny that would be really funny to have a oh, character God. like that yeah what's your wisdom and your intelligence uh three can we have zero is that yeah. okay <laughs> yeah. yeah uh you suddenly can't speak or yeah. breathe for that matter <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I think sometimes people don't realize, like if you had a humanoid character in your intelligence, if it goes below, like if it goes below, probably five, maybe, no, maybe six or seven, if it goes below that, you're entering like beast territory, right? Like, yeah, you know, like your character That's actually, might, be, that might not be as like smart as a bears and things. Or, yeah. Oh, le you're probably less smart than a bear. <laughs> Like maybe this, you, we're not sure this adventurer could find their way home at the end of the night. <laughs> you guys are tired and require a long rest. What do you yeah. do? This tree. This well, tree? We have some local mean? politicians tree. like that here in Vancouver, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> Zing. Uh, <laughs> Where do I live? <laughs> exactly. Why do I live here? What is going on? Who are these people? Do they live here? What's our um, quest about again? Where are we going? Like, uh, <laughs> who is that? Pippin in Lord of the Rings? Where are we going? <laughs> We've just... Um, you know, you've had a meeting for seven hours about your plan to destroy the ring with a group of 12 people, and you were sitting right there. We're going to Mount Doom. Where are we going? Yeah. 
Oh man. Um, I every time we talk about this stuff, I just want to make another character. Yeah. Um, but next week, uh, we are going to talk about the basics of gameplay. That episode is scheduled for nine hours. Yeah. So, just so you're all aware, it but could be a multi-part only... episode. Right. But in game time, that's only twenty-five minutes. So. Oh well, all right then. So so it's fine. It'll work yeah. out. It'll yeah. be great. You're going to enjoy every solid packed minute of that one um but thank you all for listening watching uh all of our contact information is of course on the youtubes uh down below the videos here uh there's also the audio version which you could go check out and uh, i encourage you to do so um and uh yeah so we'll see you next week and don't forget this podcast is brought to you by kwood publishing purveyors of fine D D related things at world of mirror Dot com. That's Mir with two R's, by the way. Um, sometimes I've heard people get confused with that spelling, which is weird, but that's okay. But uh, thank you again, Andrew, and uh, I will see you next week, and see you all then. Bye. Thanks, Shane. Later.